Welcome, guys, to another episode of the Content Creator Life. Today, we have a special guest, Dylan. How are you doing, man? I'm doing fantastic. How are you doing today, Zach? I'm doing great. Uh, it's been a long time since uh, we talked and uh, used to live in Vietnam, right? So now you're in Bali. I did. Uh, but uh, we we used to talk about a lot of things concerning, you know, YouTube, video creation and, you know, content creation. But just to, you know, introduce yourself to the audience, can you tell us a bit about yourself and uh, what you're doing now? Yeah, so I, I, like you mentioned, I live in Bali and I have a YouTube channel, which I'm about to reach 26,000 subscribers, which I'm so grateful for. It's so awesome to to see that growth, but it has taken surprisingly a long time, more, I think more time than I, than I thought. I started three years ago in, in Saigon and, uh, and it has grown to, to almost 26, but you, you gotta, there is no end, right? So I can't be thinking yes. once I, you know, once I get to this point, you know, then I'll, then I'll be good. You have to enjoy the journey and I'm, I'm enjoying it. And also on the side, so that's kind of something that has now been taking more of a full-time role in my life, which is awesome. But I also am a freelance videographer and editor. So I create video projects for different companies. And the the big company that I do work for right now is a plug-in manufacturer called Motion VFX, which you know of, right? Yep. Yeah, I love really, the product, especially on Final Cut. Yeah, they're, they're fantastic, and they're diving more into DaVinci Resolve, and I th actually think they're putting out some Premiere plugins as well. Oh, wow, I did not know that. Yeah, just a few. I don't think they're diving too deep, especially because a lot of people are making a jump from Premiere to Resolve or Premiere to Final Cut, and so I, I don't think they see a lot of benefit in going all in on Premiere, and plus there are so many mm -hmm. Premiere plugins too, but... Sorry, we're kind of diving off. Uh, no worries. We, we, we're going to get to the, to, the, to the practical aspect of uh, making videos. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm a Final Cut user, uh, as you know, and I switched from Premiere a couple of years back. And honestly, I'm, I'm not looking to, uh, to go back to Premiere. So uh, yeah, I would good either. luck to the people who want to try Premiere. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So Dylan, I, I want to talk to you about your YouTube channel. And congrats, by the way, on the mind stall of 26,000. Thank um, you. Can you tell us a bit about the kind of video? Yeah, sure. Uh, about the kind of videos that you make and the content that you usually create, especially for YouTube or maybe uh, other platforms. Yeah. So the, the main content that I make is Final Cut Pro tutorials, but then I also have filmmaking, videography, tips and tricks as well. And uh, I, I love diving into sound design. So I have tons of sound design tutorials as well. I also have, I do gear and plug-in reviews, which is something that I would like to get into more on my channel. I don't have uh, a ton of videos, maybe like 10 or 12. And then I also post my own pieces of work on that channel as well. So like I, I make a lot of cinematic travel films. Recently, I've been loving creating video portraits of models and i find that that's a great way to show how uh adept i am at cinematography and it's nice because usually they're short you know there's like a minute 30 so it up for me it always feels good to accomplish a video that is like solid and short i think that's why people enjoy creating vertical videos so much but yeah that's essentially my channel in a in a in a Nutfold. Nutfold? That's not a that's not a word. <laughs> Nutshell, whatever, yeah. <laughs> Nutshell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I I could uh, I could use nutfold as well. So um Dylan, um w w would it be fair to say that like uh you enjoy those kind of like uh, portrait videos more than the tutorial in terms of the actual production? Because that's something that I heard a lot from filmmakers, especially on YouTube, is that there's this idea of like one for me and one for them, which means the audience and they usually uh, like those kind of like creative videos, which tend to not do as well as the tutorials. Is that is that a correct assessment? That is a correct assessment, I, especially with tutorials. I can't make editing tutorials all the time. It gets dull and yeah. stale for me, you know, even and it's I've become so good at it since I've done it for three years that I just fall into like a, 
a robot routine and mechanical mode yeah mechanical mode and uh i can get into that flow state way better when i'm kind of pushed to be more creative and create something that i really enjoy and i do enjoy making the tutorials just not nearly as much as like as these video portraits or travel films but yeah you're right i think that's something a lot of people struggle with is they will put out a video that they really enjoy on their channel that's a little bit outside of their niche and it gets like, you know, it shows up in the YouTube studio as nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10. Uh, yeah. I'm not a rate for people that don't know YouTube. That's not like a rating. That's uh, it says like your last 10 videos, this rates like ninth place out of 10 or whatever, 10th place. And so that sucks to see that. And I think a lot of people get discouraged, but like you mentioned, that's what keeps us happy you know, making those that's those videos that we really enjoy making, even if they don't get a lot of views. Yeah, it's about keeping yourself sane as a creator, right? And, and keeping yeah. that creative moment momentum. Um, Dylan, I want to ask you about the actual process of creating those videos. Uh, so you, you have a choice to talk first about the tutorial one or the portrait one, uh, whichever you want to talk about first in terms of how do you start that creation process from mm. no idea to an actual video being uploaded? The tutorials are easy for me, it, obviously, because I've done a, done created them for three years. But uh, the fact that I use, I use TubeBuddy, I don't know what you use. I think it's VidIQ or do you use TubeBuddy? I use TubeBuddy? VidIQ, yeah. Got it. Yeah. So, VidIQ. so with, with TubeBuddy, I have a video topic planner. I think you use Notion, which you were trying to gear me towards which i definitely should dive into mm -hmm. but in TubeBuddy, they have a video topic planner and so i have constantly if i'm like if i'm just thinking or especially if i'm cooking or driving i'll get an idea like yeah that'd be a great idea for a tutorial and so i have a list of i don't know maybe a hundred tutorial ideas and when i am thinking about a tutorial the first thing that i start with is the title everything then everything else will flow a lot better and once i have the title then i head into microsoft word i know i should be using notion but microsoft word is so easy uh, or mm -hmm. i'm sorry google docs is what i use google docs yeah. yeah yeah and uh and so then i create the script usually i'm at the point now where i know just about everything in final cut pro i do learn some new things i'm not i'm not totally uh, fully knowledgeable but most things i can create a tutorial without having to kind of like research things but mm -hmm. if it is something that is requires like a step-by-step -step process what i'll first do is go through the process myself without screen recording anything and then i'll write the script as i'm like saying okay yeah this next step blah 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 and once i have that script then i will uh head into my booth which essentially is just a uh, a couple padded things by a mattress that I like just try, you just want to make sure that the sound won't reverberate off of the walls. And so if you, what I used to do is put a blanket over my head and then I use, and then I record using the mic and stuff. And then in post, you can spice it up a little bit, but then that prevents a lot of the reverb. But so I'll record that. I'll put it in final cut pro. I'll chop it up on a timeline and then I will screen record. And with that screen recording, then I will put that over top of that voiceover and I'll chop that up and speed up parts that I need to. Maybe I like went too fast when, when, uh, or I go too slow in the recording. So I'll speed it up a little bit. And I found that people enjoy the length of my tutorials because they're not like 30 minute tutorials. It's mm -hmm. 10 minutes. You don't need to see me like going up to the tab and then slowly going down. I'll speed up that clip by two or three times so you can kind of get the information that you need. And then I will, after that's all cut up, then I'll add all the, the pop-ups and the titles and the things that spice up my tutorials a little bit and add sound effects after that and then place in music and do some audio ducking. So in the sections where there's a gap between my voiceover, I'll increase the audio of the music and and just continue that process and then export and 
upload to YouTube. And as you know, you're not done there. Then you have to make the thumbnail, which takes a while. Mm -hmm. And then you have to do the metadata, which takes a while. But, but uh, yeah, I think the hardest part probably for me is researching and, uh, and like screen recording and stuff. That's the, that's the part of the video process that I wish I could just jump to starting to chop everything up. But I guess that's, that's okay. where everything lies. Um, for me, it's a bit different. Like I actually enjoy the, the, the actual filming or the process of making the video, mm. but what really gets uh, a bit tricky for me is the editing part. So oh, it's reversed. Um, <laughs> oh, oh, well, yeah, I know. Um, but it, we have different backgrounds. So that's why, like, uh, for me, like video editing was always something I had to learn just to make the videos. It's not something that yeah. I had in my background. And, yeah. Um, but, but, uh, I, I want to go back to the, to the, uh, the process of, of like, you know, editing and also like, uh, mm -hmm. adding those yeah. effects. Can you walk us through about the software you use? So sure. Yes, Cut sorry. And what kind of like plugins yeah. and, you know, uh, imagine the, the, the people listening to you are not, you know, familiar with those terms. Got it. Yeah. I don't even know. I, I may have gone too specific on what I just mentioned, like audio ducking and stuff, but I use final cut okay. pro and uh i i forget what i started out with but it was like one it was like an older version i think it was i'm not sure when i was like 10 or 12 i started with a software that i can't exactly remember and then there was a big gap where i stopped uh making videos and then i used iMovie for like a year or two in college just for a project and then i switched to final cut but so i use final cut pro which in my opinion is one of the fastest professional editing softwares that you can use and it gets a bad rap by a lot of people because it looks a little bit like iMovie but to me I mean it's it's just as powerful as like Resolve maybe not with color grading but it has all the features yet it is visually appealing and that keeps me at least more in the flow state and allows me to be more creative because certain aspects that may like suck you out and are a little bit too technical are more condensed and put into a prettier package. So I, I love Final Cut Pro and I use quite a lot of plugins. Obviously, you know that the majority of my plugins are motion VFX because they are a client of mine. So I have nearly every motion VFX plugin, which is which is pretty sweet, but I, I will create a tutorial on my favorite motion VFX plugins next month. But I, I do use a couple others. There's a, a plugin from Ripple Training, which is a uh, video training series or company that for Final Cut Pro that creates like zoom in, zoom out plugins. And so I mm. use that for zooming in and, and out of my tutorials and stuff. But for video portraits and, and my travel films, it's totally different. I use a lot of different like flares. So if you, basically for people who don't know what plugins are, you will purchase these, download them, and they will show up in your editing software and they allow you to make tweaks to your footage, whether it be uh, like adding a certain motion, titles that are already animated for you, transitions that will help you to not make it just a single jump cut from one clip to the mm -hmm. next. It'll be like a, a zoom in or a slide or different stuff like that. And so it just makes plugins help to make your footage look better in a very short amount of time. In the past, you'd have to hop into what would be like Apple Motion or um, mm -hmm. or After Effects, and you'd have to create that yourself. But this just allows you to really speed up your workflow. And a lot of plugins, yes, they are expensive, but in my opinion, as you know, time is money, and it really helps speed up the process and also make your footage and, look yeah, a like, lot better. If there is, yeah, if there is an, an analogy that I, I can come up with is the extensions on Chrome. So think of like uh, plugins like extensions that will add more features to your program. So uh, the, the yeah. ones that I use the most is, are the titles, the animations, and 
like you said, those save a lot of time for me. And you don't have to pay a lot of money for each plugin. So I have an Inveto uh, Element yeah. uh, subscription, and I'm that gives me access that. to, you know, <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. So I love their, their collection because they give uh -huh. you access to like music, uh, audio, yeah. graphic templates, stock video. video templates and, and photos. stock video. And, and every time I, I, I look at the collection and I'm impressed by the quality of, of like the, the catalog. Cause, uh, you know, if you got, got a subscription that kind of like all in one, sometimes yeah. you don't get those like high quality plugins or effects, yeah. but recently they've been adding so much, you know, cool stuff that I'd be like, oh, that's really interesting. That should be actually paid, not just part of the, the Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, and all this, in all, it's pretty yeah. cheap for the most part. Yep. And you can share it if you want with uh, a team of people. Oh, I didn't know that. Do you have to have a, like a separate license for that? Or is it like if I have the individual plan? Um, I think, yeah, so it's a bit tricky when it comes to the licensing part, right? Yeah. So you have to create a license for each different, uh, like each different download yeah. that has the name of the original owner. But mm. in terms of the plugins, you don't need the license. So for, for music, uh, like, yeah, you need that. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, but uh, uh, Dylan, I, I want to ask you more about the, you know, the process of uh, editing and how how difficult was it for you at the beginning and how did you like, learn or not really learn but just like how did you progress with it so yeah. think about no, somebody who's question. really frustrated with editing and and they want to yeah. want to learn more or they want to make it an easier part by the way that's me <laughs> is that you okay so, so i'm talking to you specifically <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and someone else all right so i i learned a long time ago i uh i would make home videos with my brothers and my cousin i would shoot constantly and the editing software was like first off i didn't have an editing software it was the camcorders that recorded in those tapes and so something i would do which is pretty funny looking back is i would draw on pieces of paper and put that up as like the title card and then you know put it down or like five seconds wow. later and then cut it you know and then and then do that again but so that, that, wow. i guess that's not exactly how i learned editing but then i got an, an editing software which i can't for the life of me remember what it was and i didn't know too much i just did like basic cuts and i, I would say the single greatest thing to improving my editing specifically is probably watching films and just being in tv shows and just being aware of how they are editing like when do they cut and even just thinking like this scene probably dragged on for a little bit longer. How did this short little montage affect me more than longer clips? And then of course, uh, of course, practice, I think just which everyone wants that magic, that magic pill. But at the end of the day, it's, it's yep. years and years of editing. I, uh, I, when I lived in Costa Rica, I tried to, I made it a point to try and create something and edit something every day if I could. And when I was in Costa Rica, I made a travel film of Jaco, which is where I lived, which is not a particularly big town at all and not a very prominent one in Costa Rica, but I made a travel film of it. And looking back on it now, it was trash. It was so bad. The sound effects were too loud. The color grading was terrible. The transitions were god awful. The subject matter wasn't even that interesting. But I was like, "Yeah, this is this is pretty good. I'm I'm pretty good," <laughs> and shared it on social media. And people also were like, "Wow, Dylan!" And it's amazing looking back on old pieces of work and realizing how much you have grown. And I'm sure maybe you have done the same thing yep. for yourself whether that be like with graphic design or whatever or old even old podcasts i'm not sure when when did you start your, this podcast it's almost a year ago and yeah there's oh, okay. something to be said about how yeah i organize stuff and even the the flow of the podcast you know yeah um, the practice is what really makes you learn it's not it's not knowledge itself it's the actual doing of stuff yeah, absolutely. It's not the glamorous thing that everyone wants to mm -hmm. say, but it 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 is how you get better 
at absolutely everything. It's just putting in a little bit of time. And I was reading a, I'm reading a book called The One, I think it's called The One, or it's The One Thing, uh, which is like a self-improvement book. And it mm -hmm. talked about how uh, it, there was a, a researcher, a psychologist researcher named Anders Ericsson, and he did the, the research that's famous about putting in 10,000 hours, which I don't know if it has been like debunked a little bit, but they broke down the how many hours a day like you should be focusing on that one thing that you really want to improve. And surprisingly, it's only you would think it'd be like the whole day, but it's only four hours. So if yeah, if, which I, I guess for some people it's a lot. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say like uh, I I read something about this uh, from a different guy who um, I, I forgot the name of the book. Uh, I'm gonna put it on the show notes. Yeah, but it's uh, it's about the the four. They call it the green zone. It's a four mm. hour window during the day that you have to do your most challenging task within because that's mm. where you have the the most amount of energy. And yeah, it, it was exactly the same amount of time, four hours. It, it might vary for people, but it's yeah. four hours that that's the max for human beings to actually focus with intensity. Yeah, yeah that's right. That was another thing that I have been listening to is that our focus, our attention, uh, our focus of length, you know, duration is about that yep. time. And someone, even Stephen King is known to only write four hours a day. And I think he just mm. does it in the morning. But from what I, I – have you ever – probably since you, uh, you're, you're a podcaster. Have you heard of Andrew Huberman, Huberman Labs? I love him. Yeah, dude. Of he's, course, yeah. He's so great. He's so eloquent. He's, a, he's so knowledgeable. Re seems like a real cool yeah. dude, someone I'd want to grab a beer with. But he mentioned that we can mainly stay focused for an hour and a half at a time. And so what he does and he recommends is like an hour and a half in the morning. Actually, this is just what he does. I forget if he recommends this, but he says an hour and a half in the morning. And then in the afternoon, he does another hour and a half of work. And that's only three hours of the day, yeah. which is nuts. But something that I try and remind myself often is that we are constantly distracted by things, whether it be like our phone next to us that happens to get like a social media pop-up notification, which you should turn that off if you haven't already. It's mm -hmm. so distracting. Or like even just sounds outside and that makes us lose our focus. And so focus is the ultimate gold right now, especially in today's society. With Absolutely. Constant context switches in TikTok and Instagram and stuff like that. So a lot, making yourself focus for a certain period of time is so rare nowadays. And I think that's where you can really succeed. And it's something that I'm trying to do because I suck at it. I suck at focusing. <laughs> we all do. Like I just had a yeah. conversation with Mike uh, the, uh, when he came here for the podcast and he saw my kind of setup here. I have a room dedicated for YouTubing and like editing and stuff. And he asked me a question like, how much time do you spend in this room? And I was like, I think around like four or five hours a day if I'm, if I'm really like focused and doing the work. Yeah. And then he said, would you, so you also have like a MacBook and stuff and you can take it to coffee shops because, you know, in Vietnam, we have this culture of like, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a coffee culture. So you yeah. sometimes just want to get, get out and take your laptop and maybe you, you can do the work at home, but you just want to get out, you know, you yeah. feel, you know, I don't know, stuck 100%. at home or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and he asked me this interesting question that I did not even think about before. He said, so would, if you have a choice between like editing a video in your desktop and at home or go into a coffee shop. And I was like, and you can actually do the same kind of like work. The, the laptop is, I have a MacBook Pro with M1 Pro. So like in terms of mm. the power, it's the same thing or even better. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? I would actually choose staying at home. And I did mm. not know why. And then I realized it's because it became like a routine for me, like a, yeah. like a ritual, right? Like, what, like automatically when I come to this room, I only do video editing most of the time oh, or in the weekends I game. Yeah. So it's kind of like, even my, in my mind, like if I come here, I'm like, Oh, I have to edit something. It's like, yeah, it's, it's became automatic for me. And, it, and that's here's not the funny your bedroom? thing. I, I, 
No, no, that's a that's a separate room. Just like oh, uh, that's good. You no, know, it's a it's a YouTube uh -huh. room. Yeah, I know, I know. I I I had to switch from like you know um, a different uh, apartment building, like a studio apartment, and yeah. now I live in a three bedroom apartment. And having Ooh. a dedicated like YouTube in room is, yeah, it's, it was really a big deal. Yeah, yeah, especially because of the, what I just said. Like when I enter this room, I'm in I'm in editing mode. I can't do anything yeah. else. But it's also it's also detrimental to me in a way because it's a funny way because I cannot write scripts in this room. I just can't. Ah. I have to take my laptop and go to a coffee shop. So you know You're what I mean? Like it's just, <laughs> yep, yep, yep. So yeah, it, it happened to me. I did not even analyze it until he asked me the question. Yeah. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, that's interesting yeah, because I, uh, I have been telling myself recently where sometimes I will get a little dis or like I'll finish a big break of work and I'll hop on YouTube and like watch some suggested videos or whatever. And now this space, which is my studio, has – I lose a lot of focus, be, and I think it's because I am orienting this studio for work as well as a little bit of leisure. And so I need – I'm trying to make it a priority of not to do any type of leisure activity in here, which is tough. But then, I, like you mentioned, I also go to this coffee shop here in Bali that I, like, just focus in on work and I rarely check social media. I'm all in on what I'm doing. And yeah, just like you mentioned, having those designated spaces, even if you have to go somewhere and pay for a coffee or whatever, that is so helpful for focusing in Absolutely. production. And one thing that really helped me that maybe the audience can learn from is the, the lighting and the, the kind of like uh, aromatic, uh, you know, smell. So I have this uh, aroma diffuser and I have different, like, uh, they, they're so cheap. Oh, there you go. There you go. And it's and, the lot. <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> I don't know if it shows. Yeah. It. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's a yeah, the Yeah, I can smell. see clearly, but yeah. <laughs> nice. Mm. So I have this different aroma, you know, oil, uh, what do you call them? Like our smells or you know, aroma flavors. Mm -hmm. Therapy, yeah, a different smells. And I found that, for example, in my bedroom, if I put jasmine, it gives me mm. this, like, relaxation mood. But if I put, like, orangey, kind of, like, um, spicy flavors in this workroom, it actually enhances the mood. And wow. the second part gets you energized. The, yeah, but it, the the smell part is is not a big deal. It's kind of like twenty percent. But what it's what was bonus. really a, it's a bonus. The big one for me is lighting. So I can just me pick too up the MacBook here. So I have the you see the the gaming setup or the, yeah. the editing machine here. It's uh -huh. red, right? And uh -huh. behind me the lights are red, right? If yeah. I'm gaming, which I do on the weekends, like I have a small YouTube channel for just like gaming and like streaming and stuff. Uh -huh. And if I put it into purple and blue, it puts my mind into, oh, I'm coming here to game. And it, I don't know how it works, but it's just like the light itself actually makes you, uh, you know, just gives you this mood or this energy to do different tasks. And it, it yeah. works for me. I don't know if it's going to work for other people, but I think we're as human beings, I bet we, we kind of like... Uh, yeah, yeah, we are we're adapted to kind of like uh, get you know input from the environment, and light is a big one. Yeah, yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right, and maybe this is the same way for you. I hate any room that has, and this is very common in Vietnam, it, it, and not so much Bali, but where you have like the fluorescent, uh, like for people that know Kelvin ranges. Like mm -hmm. 56, anything above 4,500, you know, where it's like really white, clinical, surgical light. Hate yep. it. Oh, makes me feel like so, gives me a little anxious. So for me, I have to have like some candles next to me. I have mm -hmm. this, all of my lights in here are uh, like a low Kelvin, like 3,500 incandescent light bulb. And that helps me just, it keeps me calm and uh, gets me kind of in the mood a little bit. So yeah, I think you're I wanna, totally I wanna, I wanna on Yeah, I want to share with you this one. You, you kind of guess what it is. Um, so this is my gaming room. And oh, that's so cool. I, I don't turn wow. on the lights when I at night. When you like, game, literally, there is no white light. No, no. I mean, oh. the whole apartment is like this. Oh, it's uh, so okay, sweet. So this when when Mike came over. So this is like wow. the whole setup here. 
see the video. Oh, you. And you I, I spent up, a lot dude. of time to actually, yep, yeah, I spent a, a lot of time Ooh. to actually, you know, set up the RGB light for the whole oh, apartment. Oh, it's the whole, and honestly, whole apartment. Yeah, even the bedroom. And it made a huge difference in my workflow. Like, literally wow. changed a lot of things. But you would I use know. that light yeah. for working, right? Maybe for writing? Or would you use Which all one? that? The purple and pink and stuff. Would you use that for working? Mm -hmm. You do? No, you, so it, that's... Oh. that's like, no, no, no. So, so the purple and the that's kind of like my my color at night. So when I come back yeah. home, that's the color that you see around the apartment. But mm. when I come to this room and I want to edit, for example, I change to red. For, you know, red is Got the it. color that I use for editing. But like it's if I'm gaming color. or something like that, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's like I'm 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 in this like intense mode. And if I'm doing like uh, productivity work or something like that, I go to softer colors, maybe a little bit blue, green. So yeah. it just it depends Comic on the mood. And, uh, it, it's, it's also fun for me because I'm kind of like experimenting with myself. Like I, I yeah. had to discover a lot of things about me and colors. And this was really, really interesting. That is very cool. And you really, it made it look really professional. Did you set that up yourself? Yeah, it took a while. It took almost like uh, two weeks to set up the whole Damn. RGB. Like I think uh, I bought almost like 20 uh, LED strips plus other oh, stuff. From... Wow. Yeah, yeah, but I, they're, they're kind of like... You're uh, a YouTuber now. Yeah, thanks, thanks. <laughs> that's that's full-time uh, YouTuber status. Yeah, that, that's the look. That's full-time, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, Dylan, I want to move on uh, talking about the actual, uh, you know, content creation day that you, mm. that you go through. Uh, can, can you tell us a bit about the... So, you, you just mentioned something about focus mode. What yeah. other things that help you get into that zone, which is really difficult to yeah. maintain? It's not about getting into it. It's actually to, how long can you stay there without being distracted, which is so easy now. With yeah. uh, uh, sorry, something I, I forgot to mention. Um, there was a, a recent study, I don't know on which website, but they found out that actually focus mode or, you know, what they call it on the iPhone, there's focus mm. mode and there's, a, a f uh, what is it? Um, it's kind of like, yeah, it's the mode that you do on your phone. To... Yeah. No, no, I mean the, the one that they had recently. The, the moon. With, um, the like moon, right? The one, yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot the name, but it's dedicated for not distracting <laughs> you. They found that actually that mode is a distraction. Really? So Why if you're that? using that, so the, because you always have, so your mind is kind of like focused on your phone not being distracting. And every time you yeah. check your phone, you might check the time. And your mind is like focused on the phone staying not distracting for you. Because in the background potentially could be like a dopamine hit of a new social media notification yep. and stuff like that. That's interesting. Yep, yep. But, so and then uh, back, uh -huh. it, the interesting one is like to actually leave your phone somewhere, not that's, that's, and keep it with you. I'm talking about the yeah. focus mode. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, so what? So what I uh, what I do, and this is something that I recommend, is I try and charge my phone at night and then right b before I go to bed, first off, I try and make sure I'm not on my phone at like at least an hour before I go to bed, which is sometimes tough, but I try and put it away two hours ahead if I'm being good. But what I will do, and I've done this for a couple of years now, is I put my phone up in the kitchen in a very high cabinet to either where I have to stand on something to get it or I have to like really reach. And in the past, I had a note that was right on the shelf that said, is it really time to get this, Dylan? And that would kind of keep me in check. So, I mean, we get this all the time nowadays where you're like, huh, I should check my phone. Or like even if it's very subconscious, you'll get this idea of your phone and, and it's so habitual now that you will go to grab it. And so this makes me realize like I'll be like look for him like, oh, yeah. It's in the it's on the high shelf, and then I realize, yeah, I'm not, I'm not gonna grab it, <laughs> and that that's something yeah. I've done that's helped out a lot, and especially because I do most of my work in the morning, having that up and away is so helpful. But like you mentioned, having your phone not in the same room or in the same area as you is gonna is something is the first step you should take in improving your focus, in my opinion. And then the other Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. And, and yeah. yeah. Go, Go ahead. ahead, sir. 
Uh, yeah, sorry, we have a delay here, so just go ahead. That's okay. Yeah. So, and then the other thing I do is I, no, I, 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 always... I, I yeah, go ahead. Sorry, we have a big delay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have a big delay. It's like almost yeah. like two seconds, right? It's All right, gotten just, big yeah, now. Yeah, okay, just go. Yeah, okay. <laughs> all right. So basically, I have my phone on airplane mode, all like nearly all all the time, and that just prevents any type of uh, any type of notification from from happening. And then, uh, what else do I do for focus? I uh, oh, in, uh, think yeah. of um, think of uh, in terms of routines and like. Mm. Um, you know, workout stuff that you do in the morning that gets you into that, that creative mode. And that's a big yeah. question for our podcast, because uh, whenever I interview guests, I try to, you know, see what what uh, each guest is doing differently from others. But yeah. funnily, now after like almost like 40 episodes, I found that there is a lot of common ground oh, for as, sure. as, a, as a host. That, yeah, and I'm not, I'm not going to spoil it to you, but I just want to hear uh, first what you do in terms of morning routines and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm a, people that know me know I'm kind of a freak in that regard that I love, I love self-improvement books. I love like trying to, I love learning new things that are like little hacks to help me improve either myself, like my, my day, my business, my, uh, my focus and stuff like that. And so it kind of here's my routine in a way. I will try and wake up around the same time, usually like 6 a.m., 6.30. And the first thing I will do is drink uh, a bunch of water. And something that Andrew Huberman has mentioned recently is just putting some sea salt, half a tablespoon of sea salt in your water in the morning. And that helps your neurons to fire, I think, a, a little bit better and it replenishes some electrolytes that you have uh have you that you have depleted it during the night and then he also has talked about you can tell that i'm big on him now is getting some direct sunlight to start your circadian rhythm and start getting you awake and so i'll like i'll go out to this rice field that's right outside and just kind of stare at the sun and, and drink my water and stuff and that's also like a little time to to reflect and try and be grateful, uh, just practice a little bit of gratitude, which I assume a lot of people mention practicing gratitude or something in the morning. And yep, uh, absolutely. Yeah, and and then also I have heard that you should delay your caffeine intake because we have a a, a hormone or a molecule. I, I'm not sure. I'm not a, a science whiz, but it's called adenosine. And if we take our caffeine, basically our adenosine is what keeps us, what gets us awake. And so I think, or keeps us sleepy. It's, it's, it's a, one of the two. And so it's, taking it's a our, regulator, right? Yeah. Something like that. And our, and our, the caffeine intake will basically postpone the release of whatever that is. So that's why some people, if they drink caffeine, like right when they wake up, after that caffeine has worn off a couple hours later or, or whatever it is, they'll feel kind of that crash and feel a little bit tired is because then the adenosine is finally like having to do its thing. And mm. so it's, this is the hardest part for me is I'll have to wait. Like you, I'm getting there about around 60 minutes, 90 minutes is really tough, but so I'll, I'll wait 60 minutes. And then while my coffee is brewing, I do something almost every day that I learned from Tony Robbins in his book, Awaken the Giant Within. And they're the, I think they're the power habits or morning habits, morning power. I don't know. The priming? It's kind of, it's not, not necessarily, it kind of is priming, I guess, but I forget what he, he named it. But I basically asked myself a couple questions in the morning. The first one is, what am I happy about today? And then why? The next one is, what am I proud about in my life and why? What am I excited about in my life and why? What am I grateful for in my life and why? What am I committed to in my life? And uh, who do I love and who loves me? And this, this just forces you to think of all the good things that you have in your life. And as you may know, and probably most people watching this know, practicing gratitude and thinking optimistically truly changes your happiness and how your life ends up unfolding. I went through a very hard time in college 
and uh, and after college. And so practicing stuff like that helped me out tremendously and got my thought process into a really healthier state. And so if if you're watching this, whoever, and you're struggling with depression, anxiety, um, like negative thoughts, anything like that, trying this every morning and forcing yourself to just think of anything. It could be like, I'm happy that I had a solid night's sleep, or I'm happy that my knees don't hurt today, or anything like that really helps to propel you forward in a positive way. And uh, so I try and do that as much as I can. Yeah, that's awesome because you answered the next question, which was uh, about <laughs> yeah. negative, uh, you know, energy and toxicity. Yeah. Uh, but can we can and we it, dive a little bit deeper? Sure. Into, yeah. Go and ahead. also meditate. I was going to say also meditation. I I meditate every day, usually fifteen minutes, you uh, fifteen to twenty minutes. Sometimes I I really struggle and can only do ten. Sometimes it's a lot more. Sometimes I can get thirty minutes in, but. I try and make it, especially because I really suffered from intense anxiety for a long time and a negative thought process. And so meditation has been so key in squelching, if that's a word, squelching that. Are you doing it in, um, in an organized form, like in a group form or just uh, your own way of meditating? It, my own way, but I... I plan to at the beginning of December do a meditation retreat here in Bali before I go back to the States. And it's going to be a five day silent meditation retreat. And I, I've heard my brother Kobe did a five day silent meditation retreat. And he just said he felt amazing and it transformed his life. And from what I know about meditation and how even just a simple daily practice has helped my life. I know five days of like true trying to be present, focusing on my thoughts and contemplating myself and who I am will be life changing. Absolutely. Since uh, we are full of noise in our head from the environment, oh, from everything, from online constantly. interactions, it's, it's insane, which is which brings us to the next question about uh, how to deal with negative uh, uh, feedback or toxicity <laughs> online. Can you tell us a bit about your experience with that? And oh, yeah. How do you manage that? Because I <laughs> think this is one of the big questions um, when it comes to how to succeed on uh, how to succeed as a creator, but also how to keep yourself sane because yeah. you can have the numbers. You can have the, you know, the million subscribers, you know, you can have the income from that. But if your mental health is suffering, and we've seen examples of that where people crash or burn out or even worse, uh, that's not really um, a successful lifestyle. So it's not just about the yeah. vanity numbers. It's about actually doing it in a, in a sane and, and a healthy way. That's the word, healthy. Yeah. So can you tell us a bit about your experience with that and um, how do you achieve it? Yeah. Yeah. And I want to, uh, to like confirm absolutely what you're saying that for me, especially everything stems from your mental health, your even, I mean, your physical health, you know, the mind body connection is so strong that if mm -hmm. you think you're a shitty person and you have constantly these negative thoughts and stuff, you're going to see it in your body, both in like the amount of even the amount of like infections or colds that you get to you mm -hmm. just wanting to to something more direct and known like you saying, well, screw it. I'll just eat some ice cream nonstop. And that can affect your your body as well. But but obviously your relationships. Right? Yeah, for sure. It's all a chain and it all stems from your mental health. And it's one of my biggest goals in, in life is trying, which is, this isn't the correct way to say it, but trying to find inner peace. But uh, the reason it's incorrect is because inner peace is all, it already is. It's not something you find. It mm -hmm. is something that you just cultivate. And it's probably one of my greatest goals uh, separate from my, my career goals. But yeah, the, the internet and social media can be cruel and it is pretty unfortunate and kind of sad that people uh, think it's okay to say something online that they would never say to, in, to that person 
in a million years. And on the <laughs> same plane, it's the same with what we speak about ourselves too. And I know a lot of people are this way. I was this way for so long where the things that I would say in my head to myself, even though it would just happen naturally, I would never say that to someone, to any of my friends. It would be so cruel. And so mm -hmm. it, that's just something that I think that it's so important to work on. And I think that if people did work on that in society, we wouldn't have so much terrible, uh, terrible comments on YouTube and, and stuff like that. But so what, what I have done, luckily, it seems that now, which is you would think it'd be the other way around. Now that I have more subscribers, I get less hate, but which sucks wow. because then people that are starting out, I mean, maybe it's, it was just me, but people that are starting out, that, that's where you're at your most vulnerable, probably. And so I can imagine that those are affecting you more. And then that probably causes people to quit. But it's kind of like the uh, yeah. it's it's the rocket effect, right? Of YouTube, right? It's like the yeah. most difficult part is the is the start, and then things start to get easier, which doesn't make sense because yeah, uh, it's supposed to be the other way around, right? Like now you have the energy, you have the confidence to deal to deal with those, but now they're nice to you. So yeah, I, I, I totally uh, understand what what you're saying. Yeah, it's the snowball effect in a way. Yeah. Okay, but so uh, Dylan, in, in terms, yeah. It, yeah, yeah so ahead. I can go into specifics. So basically, uh, there there was – I've got a couple comments of people that have been rude and stuff. And usually it's very hard for me to say nothing. And this is because – partly because mm -hmm. I grew up in a, a house of, of guys and my, my dad loves to argue. He's very, very competitive. And so for me, it's second nature – to jab, to get, get that jab back. To have the, the last say, right? Yeah. And it's, say. it is so me more than my brothers. And mm -hmm. it, it, I like, I am so competitive that I feel like I need to have the last say, but something that I found and is more fulfilling and ends up getting me better results is not retorting back with why I'm right. And they're wrong, which is very egoic in itself. And I, and I should push that aside, but it is it is responding with kindness and like even though you know so say someone says you don't know what you're talking about you should have done this quit youtube something like that i, I will respond with something like like i appreciate your feedback i'm sorry you feel that way and uh i will you know I'll do my best to try better but this is kind of the way i am something like that and it may it may be very hard for you to say that and for you to type that because you want to like be like, well, then don't watch my videos. I was right, blah, 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 all this stuff. But for me, it end, I find that more people end up responding back like, oh, yeah, no, I, I was being rude. I was being mean. I'm sorry, Yeah, yeah, man. exactly. It is shocking <laughs> how many people do that. It's almost like they – I did the for, same thing. Right? What, did, what happened with you? Yeah. So I had like a, uh, some, not really toxic, but just negative uh, feedback about some of my, I think I told you about this, M1 videos for MacBooks. Yeah, So I was right. criticizing uh, what Apple did with the M1, and I was talking about some of the things that are not working. So basically, I'm just telling them, hey, if you want to buy the M1 MacBook, this is where, uh, when it was first released, um, you should be aware of this. The Bluetooth has some issues and stuff. And some people who are like super fans or like fanboys of Apple, they did not like the way I was phrasing stuff. So they wanted me like maybe to dis disregard all of the issues. And in the comments, they were like kind of being a bit mean, you know, you don't know yeah. what you're talking about. Like the, the MacBook doesn't have this issue. It's better than a PC. And I was like, I was tempted first, like you said, to just say something mean back or, but I was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to be professional. I'm just going to be a professional, you know? I just responded like, okay, thank you for your feedback. I did not know about this or like, oh, this is what I meant. And honestly, I got the same thing as, as you just said. People said, say, oh, sorry, look, I did not mean that. I just said, oh, and they were like uh, very apologetic. And, and it was really interesting to see that maybe people at, uh, in the first uh, time they comment, they phrase yeah. things differently and they don't think about them. But once you face them with a bit of like professionalism and also kindness mixed into that, yeah. Things turn out to be really good. And you yeah, have like, to be careful like because human. online now, like, 
Yeah, exactly. Like a human being. And you have to, uh, what I'm saying is that, uh, especially online on Twitter, YouTube, or, or any platform, you have to be kind of careful nowadays with what you're saying because it's yeah. going to stay there forever and people can use it against you in the future. So think about that if, if you, if you are having this rage moment or you want to, you want to be mean back. Uh, go yeah, ahead. Sorry, you, even, even, no, that's this. okay. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. I, I enjoy hearing that story. Even taking like time to, uh, to not reply helps a lot because then you come back to it with a clear head and then you can kind of write that response and stuff. But yeah, it, it, I think it just makes people like realize, Oh yeah, this is, this is just a guy. This isn't like some, uh, I don't know, some robot and stuff. Mm -hmm. And the other reason I think we should be responding in that way is because we are, we're run. We, this is a business, you know, my YouTube channel is a business. And if I'm respond, if like Walmart <laughs> responds to a social media post and says, screw you, Susan, like, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Don't buy it. Yeah. They're going to, they're going to get some <laughs> backlash over the internet. And so you got to kind of be the same way. And unfortunately it, when you're, when you're in the public eye, you, you have a lot more to lose because then there's a, you know, you have a, a name to tarnish in a way, not saying that like, I'm big at all, but it just is something to remember. And if I do be, gain a larger following, it's something yeah. that I, you know, that I'll have to remember a lot more often. And you can always see it in the other, like uh, the, the dark side of it is that pe people or companies who go the other way and they don't do it like in a kind or professional way, they, they get destroyed. And one example I can think of in the gaming industry was uh, EA or DICE with Battlefield. So they oh, literally yeah. said the the director of yeah the director of marketing literally said to them because uh, just a short story like Battlefield was a really famous game for destruction and like World War kind of like FPS uh, shooter and uh, they made some changes that make it kind of arcadey so the fan base were were you know they were not really happy and they said okay can you change this stuff and the guy director of marketing literally said if you don't like it don't buy it. Mm. Yeah, and that's that rough. just made the communities like it, it so things were cool at the beginning but just this saying he made things worse for the whole company and people start to boycott the game and it's just like it's a whole mess and if he, he just fired? said like I oh take it. i think so i think so because like you know <laughs> things start to escalate and people boycotting the game and the community yeah. is raging and so, like, imagine if you just said, oh, thank you for the feedback, and uh, we're going to look into it. Okay, that's fine. People would forget about it. The people don't have time for you. But once you start yeah. to attack back and, like, have this kind of engagement, it's it's really toxic. And it's never it, it ha has never done anything good in my experience or what I see. Yeah, for sure. You'll lose. You'll absolutely lose a huge audience. And then if you respond the other way, you'll gain an audience because they'll be like, oh, wow, it's like that's a – that's a human it's refreshing, person. right? Yeah, it's refreshing. It's kind The you could tell the people really care about helping the customer. And that's what matters in, in business. What it shouldn't be about money, which I know that's kind of what most people's minds are geared towards. It's about the value that you can create to your customer. And from there, then the money grows. But but value and trying to help those people out is should be the most important priority. Everything else will follow after Absolutely. that. So Dylan, we just uh, talked about a lot of the uh, psychological aspects of being a YouTuber or creator yeah. of content. Um, can, can we talk a bit about like the YouTube strategies and yeah, dude. How, Whatever uh, you want. how people can grow on YouTube? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, is there something you want to say about the uh, YouTube strategies for growth? And especially there's now the short form. Uh, I don't know mm. if you're using short videos and... Can you tell us a bit about any strategies that you want to share and how can yeah. people grow on YouTube, especially now, 2022? Uh, well, the, the number one thing is to make sure the videos that you have provide value, obviously. But something that's surprisingly even more important are, is making sure that you have a great title and a great thumbnail. And one way that you can do that is trying to not necessarily give away what the video is about in those two things. It, you need to make it intriguing in a sort of way. 
So like in terms of my own niche, if there is a, a plugin that can do a certain feature, whatever, I wouldn't just say, uh, I wouldn't just say zoom in plugin review or overview that would not get a lot. And then just have like a picture of the plugin as the thumbnail that would not get a lot of clicks. Even if it's a really great overview and stuff like that, if someone doesn't click on your video, that video is going to get squished by YouTube. And so what you need to do is instead twist it to where the title is something like this plugin could change the way you make videos. Already that title is like, oh, what, what plugin is that? Very interesting. And then you, the thumbnail could be something like uh, – like an arrow pointing to what it does and then just say like amazing feature or something. And mm. something that I've heard, I think from think media, which is a obviously you know, them very famous. Of course. You, yeah. YouTube channel is that your thumbnail should have generally no more than three, three, uh, three, not icons. What am I looking for? Three, three elements. Things, oh, three th elements. Yeah, That's yeah, exactly three, right. Yeah. yeah. Three elements in the thumbnail. So whether it be like, like a word or two or three, one to three words is generally okay in the thumbnail. And then you have say, uh, like you pointing to something, a typical YouTuber, typical YouTuber mm -hmm. thing. And then whatever that thing is. So if it's a, if your niche is about gaming, it would be like, like this game is nuts. And then the, the gamer with their headphones on, like looking up at, uh, at yep. like maybe um, even a, even like a game that's like blacked out and there's a question mark on it. That mm -hmm. would be like, even I would click on it and I don't watch gaming videos. I'd be like, what yep. game, you know? Yeah, exactly. and, then it, and then if the value is there in the video, then, then people are gonna be like, Oh hell yeah. Like it's I'm not all a clickbait. Yeah, yeah, it's not clickbait, and the the person's like, I'm all about this channel, and then they subscribe. But that that click through, that clickability, is everything. Do you feel the same? Uh, are you uh, absolutely? Uh, I just want to ask you: Are you of the opinion of like putting your face out there on the on all the thumbnails, or is it is it the does it depend on some factors on having your face with this kind of like uh, a reaction, a reactional face? That's the word. Yeah. <clears throat> well. My buddy, uh, this was a little while back. My buddy's channel has grown a little bit, but he had found that he didn't see much of a difference with his face being on the video or not. I, I do think that if you are a, a larger YouTuber, having your face on the thumbnail will get you more clicks and you should probably do it. Uh, if you are smaller, I think it goes both ways. I think you could probably get the same amount of clicks if you have your face on it. Uh, or if, if you don't, and it's just a, a normal thumbnail, but it is interesting. And there have been studies done that yes, having that type of YouTuber shocked face, anything that is not mm -hmm. neutral or surprisingly like happy, maybe like super happy, like really excited could help, but yeah, the, on, that, on the extreme side, you know, extreme on the side, extreme of emotions, side right? that's right. Because then for one, our like on a primal level, our minds are mm -hmm. geared towards <laughs> recognizing those faces and being like, well, what's wrong? <laughs> what's up? Yeah, and then you exactly. Look at, you look it's at it and you're like, oh, the, yeah. Yeah. What were you saying? It's part Sorry. of the human experience, right? Yeah, I just saying like yeah, exactly what you're saying. Like it's part of the human experience. And um, uh, I had some, you know, not debates, but, uh, you know, a conversation with some other creators and other people saying that, yeah, sometimes that can be too much, you know, the YouTuber kind of like meme and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, it's like, it is what it is, right? It's part of marketing. It's like, even if you know what it is, like you said, you know that literally that's how people, you know, uh, like how YouTubers make you click. Even if you know the, the, the whole design behind it, the whole plan behind it, you still want to click. Even if you yeah, know, because as human right. beings, you... You just have to, yeah, it works. It's part of marketing. It's the same thing that McDonald's or Pepsi or Coca-Cola does. You know that they want to sell you their products. You know all about marketing, but you're still going to click. You're still going to get engaged with those kind of like interactions. So it doesn't right. matter how you feel about it. It just, it is what it is. That's how I, uh, yeah. that's how I see it at least. There's a reason those marketing tricks work and why they're used. It's a reason why like 
they use certain oh gosh what what did I what did I hear recently is that oh yeah like on junk food and stuff or like cereal mm-hmm. boxes they they choose specific colors because our primal brain is designed towards identifying colorful fruits as like as, as we should we should eat them and grab them and so it or the, uh, or put, the number one like play. nine nine ninety nine you know it's ten dollars oh, it's no, not nine ninety nine right oh so, yeah uh-huh um, I mean, yeah yeah the the yeah, ninety nine the... cents you know they use that on purpose it's like a di- seems sounds smaller. like a discount, but it's like yeah, yeah, it seems smaller, but you know, you know it's almost ten dollars or it's the same as ten right you're not gonna yeah. give them zero zero one uh dollars, but like it's just a trick that works and it's yeah. been used universally all the time, and for YouTube going back to like creating content and making the thumbnails or engaging. I uh-huh. think if you start to use those, you know, um, those uh, strategies like the three elements part, the hook, which we did uh, an extensive like work around uh, in our recent workshop here in Vietnam, uh, we had Mike and Chris, you know, dive deeper into actually making a video. And the funny mm. thing is that uh, one of our attendees, who was the winner of the challenge, used these techniques to make a video. So the challenge after the workshop was he has to go back home and make a video with those uh, strategies and his video oh, now cool. is blowing up with exactly the same things oh uh, very yeah. cool yeah he has like uh the title of the video is like how i made um how i made one million dollars with e-commerce and how you can too or something like that so oh yeah good it, title the, the same elements yeah yeah same same elements and it works i mean that, that's what i'm trying to say it works these things work. It's not just yeah. oh, you can try them and you know wish for the best. No, it actually works. There is a big thing uh, about marketing to, to be said here. Yeah, tried and true. Absolutely. So, Dylan, I want to move on to uh, one of the last questions here. Um, if you if you had to start today uh, from scratch, let's say you don't have the numbers, you don't have the uh, you don't you don't have the uh, the videos, you don't have the the work is not there, but you have the strategies, you have the mindset, right? Mm. What would you do differently if you had to start from scratch? Because like sometimes when I ask this question, like people assume that I'm asking about starting from scratch as in you don't know anything yet, but yeah. that's the same thing as what we all did. So, but how about starting from scratch, but with what you already know, what you learned from the mistakes and uh, how you can do it differently? Oh man, that's a great question. In my same niche, you're saying? Yeah, no yeah, way? same thing. The YouTube channel, mm. yeah, for filmmaking tutorials. Well, for for one, I think I box myself in a little bit with these Final Cut Pro tutorials, which I do like making, and I have created a good subscriber base from that. But I also don't want to be just known as the Final Cut Pro guy, you know. And so that's why I do have my filmmaking tutorials and gear and plug-in reviews. But I think I wish I had started out creating a more evenly, uh, even amount of those. Uh, but I do understand that you should niche down. And I'm not sure that I yep. could have made those specific videos as much as I would have liked. So I have a similar I, thing, actually. Yeah. Yeah. What is yours is a. Uh, would be it's like, about like is... product reviews uh so like on my tech channel i i i want to move away from product reviews but they're kind of like what people are looking for and my channel kind of grew as a hacking touch channel with this kind of hacking tutorials and stuff like that so uh, i want to move away from that and do documentary style which was mm. actually what i wanted to do from the beginning but sometimes you know with youtube you have an idea of like how your channel gonna look like but then you go this way and after many many uh many iterations or many videos you're like oh wait a second that's not actually what i want to do and um it's it's a bit tricky because on youtube like it's the what kind of videos will get interaction and stuff so uh for your own you know channel and experience which what kind of videos would you want to do now that you think um if you started like from today you would do them um differently or uh, in in a different fashion um so, well, I, th- I think I learned pretty quickly. I started out videos where I was s- recording while I was doing the tutorial, which some people do do. 
for me, I can't. I end up rambling. The video gets maybe like 30 minutes long. And so I have found that this process of uh, researching and and then writing my script and then using the uh, – creating the voiceover and then screen recording because then if I – am doing the research and I uh, uh, and I realize that I need to switch something up, that something is incorrect, then I can do it right then and there. But if I had like screen recorded first, mm. then then I'd have to go back and do it. So just having that process that I have found works the best has been so helpful for me. But if I could go back and switch something up, can you repeat the question one more time just so I can think of it, please? It's just like, yeah, yeah. Okay. A simple question would be, if you had to start from scratch, redo your YouTube journey, but knowing what you already know with, with the experience mm -hmm. and the knowledge and the mistakes, what would you do differently? It could be about frequency, you know, maybe making more videos, less videos. What would be about uh, strategies that you will implement in mm -hmm. this uh in this time that will make yeah. it better for you. So, okay. Yeah. I Which got goes it. So, back to uh, right. an, an advice. Yeah. Advice for somebody starting today. So it's okay. It's going back in time, but also it's an advice for somebody who's starting today. So uh, this is something you have done very well. I think since the beginning of your channel is creating mm -hmm. a theme for your channel. Like as far as, and this is something luckily that you can change as far as like thumbnails go is, I, when I started off creating videos, my colors were all over the place as far as thumbnails. And I think I maybe like switched up the fonts constantly and stuff like that for the thumbnails. And something you should do if you're starting your channel is think about what are some consistent colors that I should use, find some fonts that you will use, and that creates sort of a brand in itself. And that's everything because you want those people to remember who you are and it's hard in a sea of youtubers so if you have if like they see your thumbnail I'm like oh yeah that's a, I, I watched i watched that guy even though they know it's another video they recognize the color or the the way you create your mm -hmm. thumbnails and that's something i started off and i didn't do well as i was just was all over the place with my thumbnails but now i have stuck to a theme i kind of have a general idea of like what my thumbnail creation should look like and so uh, that's, kind of, that's kind of what I would focus on if I was starting a new. Branding. Yeah, if I was, yeah, branding. And uh, oh, another, something else that's interesting is I started off with a, an intro, you know, where like people do like, today we're going to do this, blah, blah, blah. And then they have their intro, da, na, 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 and they, the logo mm. will come up and stuff like that. The logo reveal, yeah. Yeah, and yes, I licensed that song, da, na, na, na. <laughs> But no, it, the logo reveal I have found is uh, is not needed. And in fact, a lot of people get annoyed by a logo reveal, yep. which is surprising to me. And so I have cut that out entirely, which I used to have. And something else that I do is I get almost right into my videos as much as possible. And I get when I do that, I get so many comments like, thank you for not giving a huge intro, intro and stuff forward, like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for yeah. us as creators, you know, we want our videos to be like stories. We want a solid intro. We want to give the context and stuff like that. But unfortunately, YouTube is just a little bit different when it comes to tutorials, at least. And I guess even with vlogs, you know, you shouldn't you shouldn't just say today we're going to do this and uh, and then I'm going to do this. You should show show. Don't tell. And so already be in that journey or be doing that process and then you can explain it while you're doing it or have some narration or something. But just realize that like we have discussed today's society is so focused depleted that, and especially with TikTok and YouTube and shorts and Instagram reels, people want to see something real quick. And so having that, uh, especially, having, uh, especially yeah. we, yeah, go. Sorry, we have a delay here. No, so. no, sorry. Go ahead. Go like ahead. I just, yeah, just especially because YouTube now is being used as a search engine. So think about it in that way, especially with tutorials. So when you search, like especially on 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 Google, right? Like if you go search on something and you see a lot of ads, sometimes you even like skip the whole website and you go for another one. You know, 
because you don't have time to put your email and stuff like that. So maybe think about it that way uh, if you're listening. Yeah, second. Yeah, I mean, YouTube is the second biggest search engine in the world behind Google. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Pretty huge. Yeah, it's the second one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. But, and so TikTok on, is number three, by the way. TikTok is considered a search engine now? Yep, yep, yep. I just what? I just read an article about it on The Verge yesterday. Oh. Literally yesterday. Yeah, it'd be so interesting it's to crazy. see how our society does like 10, 20 years down the road and how this short form content conforms uh, forms our society. I do th- I do think Which, if, if you are listening, uh-huh. if someone's listening to this and they want to find a way to get ahead in life, the probably the single greatest thing you can do is cultivate your your focus muscle. And I think you will get ahead if if you can cultivate that and you kind of have some yep. some discipline and, sh- and sh- stuff like that, you know. And and uh, something Absolutely. I don't know I if agree you do you. this. So I have a a huge I would turn the camera around but that'll take too long. I actually bought a teacher's mm-hmm. whiteboard that's massive and rolls uh. and I u- and I use that I forgot to mention this in my daily routine but I'll write down um, in this journal of mine, I have a year, I have a yearly goals. Then I break that down into quarterly goals and then into monthly goals, weekly goals, daily goals. And so on my board, then I have the monthly and the weekly and the, and the daily. And that like really directs my focus because I'd be all over the place. If I, if I just was like, well, today, I guess I'll do this. Absolutely. You know, do you have something similar? Is- I'm at- no, no. It's funny that you ask a question because I'm thinking of getting one. I'm just looking for uh, a one that's kind of like, uh, what do you call it? Deflatable? Not deflatable. It's kind of like uh, retractable. So yeah, I don't like want a... it to be uh, all the, yeah, I don't want it all to be all the time there, but like Why actually though? I'm thinking of that. Why would you not want it to uh, be there all the time? Uh, because this is kind of like my YouTube setup. So sometimes I, I like, I want to have the background with a different light or different structure. So just a, mm. a practical thing for me to change the, the scene or change the background. Yeah. So I don't want it to be all the time there. Uh, but yeah, it can be moved. I mean, like, it's just like, you know, with some legs and stuff, it can be moved. Mm. But I was thinking about it because on Notion, I have exactly what you're saying, but in a, in a digital format. So I have the big dashboard called the master the master content creation dashboard and then oh, goes yeah. deeper into different sections and that helps a lot. But of course, if you see it, uh, like you said, uh, you write it down with your, with your hands, right. And you see it in front of you all the time. It helps a lot to keep you focused. So much, and dude. something I want to add to what you, yeah, to what you said about being investing in being fo- a focused individual mm. will, will get you ahead in, in life. I think that's, something to be said about how our society now is being like deprived of yeah. uh, attention and focus on all this stuff, but it's also because of the content that's being created. So th- a lot of people right. said that, Oh, maybe long form content now is going to die because of the new short form. But I think if you actually invest in learn how to make good long form content, which, which is something that I'm trying to do now with documentary style videos, I think that will go a, a long way. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, because if everybody's going to short form, it's going to create this gap. And it's always about how can you um, how can you find opportunities in the gaps? Yeah, fill the Especially market. Fill the market, yeah. Or the opposite, I guess. But yeah, find you know find what where there's not a lot of competition, but you know is popular. And so with the internet, there's always like trends and stuff. And if you can find a way to start. Uh, you know, filling those small gaps, it can go a long way. Yeah. So, uh, Dylan, uh, we we're almost done with the po- with the podcast. Uh, can Damn, you tell us? About... I was ready for another two hours. Yeah, <laughs> yeah really. Yeah. We can do it it's next fun, time, man. another episode. Yeah, uh, please. Yeah, I I really enjoyed it. But uh, the last question I want to ask you is about um, what would you say now to somebody who's confused about creating content? Um, mm. They have the ideas, they have the the material, they have everything they need but it's always about the psychological challenge and the mindset part. Um, this would be your advice to them and tell us then about your next projects and where can people find you? Yeah. This is your final statement. It's kind of like talking to them. Now you're talking to them. Yeah. So this, if, uh, and this is a problem I think a lot of people have where they like, maybe you have put out a video 
obviously I'm speaking to the, the audience, maybe you have put out a video where you expected it to do well on your channel or like two or three and you are crushed that it just has like 10 views and stuff like that. Or maybe even your, uh, maybe even like you're a year into the channel and you're just not getting the results that you want. My advice to you is to keep pushing along and realize that this, there is, like we have mentioned, this, there's no destination. The journey is absolutely the destination. And trying to, seeing this as a science experiment where you can tweak certain things and notice maybe in the analytics how that does compared to your other videos is the best way to to grow and not and make sure that you don't get discouraged and get in your head because everyone like even the big YouTubers and creators have been in their head and think that um what is the not not the syndrome but uh where you feel like you're imposter you feel like you're you're not worth it. You feel like you're oh imposter. Yo, oh, sorry, you did say it. Imposter syndrome. Uh, yeah, the imposter syndrome absolutely is something that everyone I think goes through. And I even have even talked to like some bigger like 500k YouTubers that feel that way. So just realize that during your journey that no one has it figured out. I'm I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I'm and even in life, I'm just trying stuff as we go along, seeing how and taking in that feedback, tweaking it, and then work and then working it out and trying to improve. So just just focus on that small, minute adjustments. Take it step by step. Another thing is don't don't think so far ahead. Like I have ten subscribers, but I want five hundred thousand. Like I I suck in life. Think okay, no, how tomorrow can I get to like 12 subscribers, what can I do to grow a little bit more? Because when you take those small steps, it makes life so much easier and you get less anxious and depressed. So just start, start slow on that journey. Take the small steps and just focus on some minute adjustments to try and go from stepping from one step to the next. And pretty soon, you'll look back down the steps and you'll be like, damn, I'm pretty far up these freaking steps. And uh, eventually you'll be at a point where a couple of years ago, you'll think back and be like, wow, I was really stressing over my life and, uh, and everything is, is fine. Like it, it's all a journey and the journey truly is the destination. Well, well said. Uh, so, so beautifully said. Oh, so Dylan, <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, inspiring a lot of people who are going to listen to this. Uh, but before we uh, finish with the podcast, what are your next projects and where can people find you online or on YouTube? Mm, uh, for, well, first off, thank you for having me, Zach. I really want to do this again. I really enjoyed it. I would love to dive more into focus and routine and, and even health because I'm super adamant about that. But I have a YouTube channel called Dylan John just my first and middle name. And uh, so you can find me on YouTube, obviously. My Instagram is Dylan John Dickerson. And the next thing I have going, uh, big, other than tutorials that I put out weekly, I'm going to Madagascar in five days. In five days, I think it is. Wow. And so, I'll, yeah, I'll be there for a month, I think till the 28th of October. And so I'm going to be creating some content from that and probably a big, a travel film that I'll post on my channel. So stay tuned for that. I'm really, I'm really excited for it. Absolutely. And I'm really looking forward to seeing that video with your mm. amazing skills as a filmmaker. Oh, thanks man. Uh, Dylan, thank you so much for being on the show. This was a pleasure. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Absolutely.